Hello students, um, this is the vocabulary video session for our lesson 6, uh, Atonement and Salvation. Uh, we have this uh, uploading because our guest is coming this coming Sunday. Uh, let's have a prayer and start. Our gracious Father in heaven, we are so much thankful to you for the salvation that, is, that you are offering to us and we accept it with all our hearts. As we study some vocabulary this time, may the Lord guide our minds to understand clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the first one we look at is soteriology. I think you know this term actually. It's from the Greek word soteria meaning salvation and it, it came from soter meaning savior and logos is study or word. So combining soter and logos, it becomes soteriology, study of religious doctrines of salvation, doctrine of salvation, study of doctrine of salvation. In Christianity, salvation also called deliverance or redemption is the saving of human beings from sin and its consequences. So salvation is deliverance from nothing else but from sin and its consequences. There are conflicting definitions of depravity, predestination, atonement, and most pointedly justification. Yet the overwhelming majority agrees that salvation is made possible by the life, crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Second term is atonement. It is the concept of a person taking action to correct previous wrongdoing on their part. The word atonement often is used in the Old Testament from Kippur, uh, which means propitiation or expiation. You know the word Yom Kippur, that is Day of Atonement, and Kippur means atonement. The English word atonement originally meant at one moment, that is being at one in harmony with someone. Atonement in Christian theology is man's reconciliation with God through the sacrificial death of Christ. <coughs> de jure uh, and de facto we will compare. In law and government, de jure, in Latin is de jure by law, describes practices that are legally recognized regardless of whether the practice exists in reality or not. In contrast, de facto uh, in Latin means in fact, describes practices that exist in reality whether or not they are officially recognized by laws or other formal norms. It is commonly used to refer to what happens in practice in contrast with de jure by law. Here is a picture comparing de jure in law, usual household residence in law, you have your couple and three children, let's say, but in de facto, there is a couple, but maybe the oldest daughter uh, goes somewhere else. Now the, the husband's brother's couple came in, for example, and they are now living together this way. So in fact, there are these people in the family, but in the law, these people are in the family. That's the comparison. Mediatorial means involving, relating to, or resembling a mediator, a person who mediates or helps to settle a dispute or create agreement when there is conflict between two or more people or groups by acting as an intermediary or go-between for those parties. Christ is doing the mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary as our mediator now. And here the two parties means between human beings and God. Of course, God is 
not uh, in like conflict with us. God loves us very much, but because of sin, we are alienated from God, and Christ is doing the mediatory work for us. Glorification is the third stage of Christian development, the first being justification, then sanctification, and finally glorification in Romans 8.30. It includes two events, receiving the nature perfection before entering into the kingdom of heaven and receiving of the resurrection bodies. So, um, our uh, fallen nature will be perfected uh, at the second coming of Christ as our body will be transformed, but uh, our uh, character will be perfected uh, by the grace of God, power of the Holy Spirit, before the close of probation and will be ready uh, for the close of probation. Tabernacle, according to the Hebrew Bible, uh, the tabernacle, Hebrew word Mishkan, meaning residence or dwelling place, was the portable earthly dwelling place of Yahweh used by the Israelites from the Exodus until the conquest of Canaan. If you look at the Hebrew word here, you see here Shakan here. Shakan mean is a verb to mean dwell or pitch a tent, right? So God is dwelling with us. That is the meaning of Shakan, and Mishkan is the um, is to make a noun and meaning residence or dwelling place. In the time of David and Solomon. The temple was constructed with the pattern of the tabernacle. Synagogue construction over the last 2,000 years has followed the outlines of the original tabernacle. Book of Hebrews describes Jesus serving as the true high priest in heavenly tabernacle, to which its counterpart on earth was a symbol and foreshadow of what was to come, according to Hebrews 8.5. Here it is the tabernacle in the wilderness, and this is the Solomonic temple, and this is the Jewish synagogue, it is an Adventist church in Berkeley, Berkeley Tabernacle Church. So this church uh, got the name from the tabernacle, and actually the synagogue has the pattern of the holy place and most holy place division in their synagogue building and likewise in the church buildings too. Redemption in Christian theology, redemption, a Greek word apolutrosis, apolutrosis refers to the deliverance of Christians from sin. Right? It assumes an important position in salvation because the transgressions in question form part of a great system against which human power is helpless. Redemption is a metaphor for what is achieved through the atonement. Therefore, there is a metaphorical sense in which the death of Jesus pays the price of a ransom, releasing Christians from bondage to sin and death. Now comes to Hilasterion for Romans 3.25. English versions translate the Greek word Hilasterion as propitiation or expiation. Concretely, it specifically means the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. In Hebrews 9.5, it is translated as mercy seat in all of the Bible translations. This word is deeply related to the sanctuary system, especially to the Most Holy, because there is the Ark of the Covenant, the Most Holy Place. Immortality of soul. In many philosophical and religious traditions, immortality is specifically conceived as the continued existence of an immaterial soul or mind, 
beyond the physical death of the body. They think after the death, there is the immortal soul going to heaven or hell. That's what they teach. However, this is not a biblical idea in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. In the Bible, it says, the soul which sins will die. Right? Confessionalist, a confessionalist church is a church like the Calvinistic churches steer to the confession of the church in their faith. Confessionalists believe that differing interpretations or understandings, especially those in direct opposition to a held teaching, cannot be accommodated within a church communion, that is the confessionalist church. Periphrastic participle, according to Mounce, which is a Greek um, grammar grammarian, this periphrastic construction originally served to emphasize the continuous force of the participle. Periphrasis contains two distinct parts. First one is a copular, meaning Amy verb, that is the B verb in English, right? and a participle phrase to express the continuous aspect of the action. So periphrastic phrases have two parts, amy verb plus participle, uh, to express the continuous action of the verb. Yes. Now Jiri Moskala, he is a professor of El Old Testament exegesis and theology and Dean of the Seventh-day Advent Theological Seminary on the campus of Andrews University. He joined the faculty in 1999. He was born in Czech Republic. He had his PhD from Andrews Seminary with the dissertation titled The Laws of Clean and Unclean Animals of Leviticus 11, Their Nature, Theology, and Rationale, an Intertextual Study. Here he supported uh, Leviticus 11 and our church position that the unclean animals cannot be eaten in our times as well. Okay, here is him. Uh, yeah, he is speaking about the investigative judgment in this picture. Right? Denton Rebok was a Seventh-day Adventist educator and administrator. Born in Pennsylvania, he served the denomination for 44 years. He spent 23 years as a missionary in China. He taught at Washington Missionary College and La Sierra College, was president of Southern Missionary College and also dean of a uh, theological seminary. He worked on the editions of Bible readings for the Home Circle in 1949, in which he made a slight changes from the original. What it means is, as he was uh, producing uh, another edition for the Bible readings for, ho for the Home Circle, he made a slight change uh, according to his own judgment on the human nature of Christ, uh, which is different from the first uh, edition of the Bible readings for the home circle. And it kind of gave a, uh, what is it, hint or base for QOD to change the aspect as well in their uh, book publishing. Grasshopper complex, when you see yourself small and insignificant in your own eyes, therefore you believe everything and everyone around you sees the same thing about you, that is called grasshopper complex. Thus you feel unable to move forward in your purpose and God-given tasks. And here is the Bible text. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anna, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. That is the text from Numbers. 
Here is the one, uh, the 12 people went to spy in the land of Canaan. And they brought the fruit from the land. And then they, 10 of them reported, we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. They were giant people. We cannot uh, win them. That's what they were saying. And we Adventists sometimes have the same kind of grasshopper complex, uh, overwhelmed by the many numbers and sizes of other denominations, and think we are small and insignificant. However, we are very, very important in God's sight because we have the truth. God gave us the truth, and we have the most developed theological system uh, in our doctrines. You've got to be very proud of it, I believe. Now we come to BRI, Biblical Research Institute. It is a service department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church with the three stated functions of research, apologetics, that means defense of the church's beliefs, in service to the church. It serves as a theological consultant to the general conference. The institute also directs the Biblical Research Institute Committee, that is called BRICOM, which consists of about 40 members worldwide. And the Biblical Research Institute Science Council, BRISCO, BRI consists of four Adventist theologians at the church headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland. That is BRI. Now we come to Edward Heppenstall. Edward Heppenstall was a leading Bible scholar and theologian of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He pre his presentations on the Law and Covenants at the 1952 Bible Conference were highly influential upon the theology of the Church. Heppenstall was one of the most influential scholars to come out against M. L. Andreasen and his theology. He authored Our High Priest and Salvation Unlimited. Uh, so there are actually two streams in our theological system in the Adventist understanding. Uh, one is called the Heppenstall line. The other one is called the Andreasen line. And Heppenstall is more um, like uh, Reformed theology, more resembles to the, to the side of Reformed theology. And Andreasen is more the pioneer's view of the Adventism, it looks like. And uh, what is interesting to me is that uh, Andreasen and uh, his so-called last generation theology doesn't mean people can be perfect or people can be sanctified without the grace of God and without the power of the Holy Spirit. But the people belonging to the Heppenstall line uh, easily think that Andreasen uh, motivated the legalistic line of keeping the law by the human power, but that is not true. We are impossible. We only depend on God and His grace and His power uh, to move forward in our sanctification and in our salvation. Now, the 18th word, reconciliation, is the process of two people or groups in a conflict agreeing to make amends or come to a truth. In Romans 5, the atonement is explained in terms of reconciliation, meaning, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So here, the reconciliation and salvation and atonement are all coming together in these verses. 
Pedagogos, it's a Greek word meaning a tutor, that is a guardian and a guide of boys. Among the Greeks and the Romans, the name was applied to trustworthy slaves who were charged with the duty of supervising the life and morals of boys belonging to the better class. The boys were not allowed, to, allowed so much as to step out of the house without them before arriving at the age of manhood. In Galatians 3.24, the law is compared to the schoolmaster who will lead to Christ, that is, Paedagogos. Here is the picture. He is the Paedagogos, and he is the, sir, he is the owner's, the Lord's boy, and he is guiding him to the school. So the law is like the Paedagogos leading the people to Christ. That is the meaning of Paedagogos in Galatians. The last one, Adventist University of France. Adventist University of France, also called in French, Campus Adventiste du Salev. I cannot read French very well. Maybe some of you may pronounce it better. Formerly named Salev Adventist University, belongs to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and is affiliated with partnership of Adventist colleges in Europe. From the campus, the city of Gen Geneva, and the Lake Geneva make a picturesque view, very, very beautiful, maybe. The campus is located in a village called Cologne sur Salève. Yeah, <laughs> I cannot read very well. Anyways, here is the campus view, very, very beautiful. And this one as well. So if opportunity is there, you may visit there as well. Thank you so much. We will meet you at 3 o'clock uh, uh, on Sunday. Bye.